Alors Elisabeth Schellekens Daman est professeure d'esthétique au département de philosophie de l'université d'Uppsala. Euh, ses recherches portent notamment sur la normativité, sur la relation entre les valeurs épistémiques, morales et esthétiques, sur la controverse du réalisme et de l'antiréalisme esthétique et sur les philosophies de Kant et de Hume. Elle a euh, publié sur l'art non perceptuel, sur la neuroesthétique, sur la valeur cognitive de l'art, et je mentionnerai notamment euh, ses ouvrages « Who's afraid of conceptual art euh, » coécrit avec Peter Goldie, paru en 2009, et sa monographie « Fort utile <rire> » qui m'a beaucoup servi, « Aesthetics and Morality » en 2007. Son exposé s'intitule « Can there be one metaphysics of aesthetic properties ?» Merci d'être là et vous avez la parole. Thank you very much and thank you very much for the invitation um, to this conference. I'm very, very pleased to be here and I'd also like to thank the previous speakers here this morning. I think some of the things I'll say fit in very nicely with the themes that have already been brought up. So what I'd like to do um, today uh, is to invite you to reflect with me um, on an assumption which, I think quite reasonably, um, has motivated many attempts to define aesthetic properties. And this is, of course, the very possibility that there can be one meaningful and helpful metaphysical theory of aesthetic properties. So can there be one metaphysical description or explanation of what aesthetic properties are? What their ontology amounts to, how they strike us in experience, and how they relate to other kinds of properties, such that finding that description or providing that explanation would represent a truly significant philosophical step in our field. So by examining the possibility of there being one metaphysical theory of aesthetic properties, I don't only mean to explore the extent to which there might be one um, kind of very definite, uh, possibly quite detailed account, which could fit all aesthetic properties perfectly, but also whether there can be you know, one general approach uh, or any kind of unified or unifying way of theorizing about aesthetic properties. I think either of those uh, would be of interest, and I'll come back to that. Now, of course, as we've already heard, um, there are several factors which count against um, the possibility in question, and I would like to focus on one of them, which has also been mentioned uh, before, and that is uh, the great variety which we find within the postulated category of aesthetic properties. So some of these things will follow in very nicely uh, from what Derek was saying about Malcolm Budd's account. So I will explore this variety and set it against the view which largely motivates the perceived need for one unifying account in order to uh, establish which of these um, ought to weigh more heavily philosophically, if you like. For a closely related concern to the one I began by mentioning, of course, and which must also be asked in this context, I think, is this. What would we actually lose if we accepted a negative conclusion on this issue, or if we conceded that there can be no um, theory broad enough to accommodate the many different kinds of aesthetic properties we tend to ascribe to the world, or at least to our experience of that world? So a question which um, lurks in the background here, I think, <laughs> is whether one metaphysics of aesthetic properties really is philosophically desirable or uh, indeed necessary for us to understand the aesthetic. So another way of putting that is, what do we really gain by having one metaphysical account in aesthetics? So these questions uh, strike me as some of the most pressing concerns to address when looking at the intersection of aesthetics and metaphysics. Now, having, having painted up this big project, my goal here today um, is not to provide a conclusive answer to these particular questions, but what I will offer 
is first a way, or a set of ways rather, of passing or organizing this variety. And I will also offer you a list of desiderata, which a solid general metaphysical account of the aesthetic, oh, sorry, account of aesthetic properties should be able to meet, I think. Now, of course, my task is made more difficult by the view to which I subscribe that not all aesthetic properties are perceptual in a straightforward sense. And so um, the non-aesthetic properties upon which the former supervene are not, are not necessarily physical or straightforward, uh, straightforwardly perceptual either. But I'll tell you more about that in a moment. So my plan, uh, in a nutshell, is just to talk you um, through what I think of as the worry I want to look at here today, namely the variety of aesthetic properties, and how that translates into a metaphysical challenge, or, or, or a couple of metaphysical challenges, in fact. And I will then list the desiderata that I mentioned a moment ago, and end by just sketching some observations, really, to do with whether we should, or whether we ought to, or maybe even must, endorse um, the skeptic's uh, conclusion. So that's my plan today. Okay. Of course, we all know um, that aesthetic properties come in many different guises, right? And that the kinds of experiences that they afford also vary considerably. So as a category, of course, we, we tend to hear this regularly, of course, they are said to range from being harmonious to uplifting and kitsch, from being ugly to vigorous, sharp, and being tightly knit. And much has been written um, about quite how diverse aesthetic properties um, can be. There is, of course, Sibley, also kind of a real spurt of activity on this front around 1988 <laughs> uh, by Metius and Herr Merian, uh, my colleague in Lund. Uh, but you'll be familiar with much of this literature, of course. Now, we can think of this variety in different ways. Okay? We can think of it horizontally if you like, uh, as a variety in range. And it's interesting to note that there are dif different spectra at play here. If you in, kind of engross yourself in this literature, you'll see that this kind of, what I think of as a horizontal variety, gets described in, in many different kinds of ways. Of course, this is not going to help us in our project, but I will spell out uh, for you some of the ways in which I find this so-called horizontal variety. So on the one hand, we find um, that we can think of this variation as one of degree of descriptive content. Okay? That aesthetic properties range from being thick, for example, garish, okay, to thin, such as being beautiful. So the idea being, of course, that um, uh, garish provides us with quite a lot of information in terms of the descriptive content of the thing. We know, for example, that it's not going to be a question of baby blue and baby pink, uh, but rather some kind of strong uh, colors, whereas beautiful, well, could look just about like anything, right? Another way of passing this uh, variety is um, in terms of um, variation of mind dependence or mind independence or a degree of mind independence, right? And of course, we've already heard uh, today about um, the way in which uh, aesthetic properties tend to be thought of as being response dependent, but again, of course, there are some uh, aesthetic properties that are more response dependent or less response dependent than others, right? So you might think of impressionist as being one example which is cited in this literature as a less response, sorry, response dependent than, for example, um, the property of being ugly, which involves, or kind of ontologically involves our responses in a stronger kind of way. A third way of passing this variety is in terms of what you might think of as formal versus affective content, okay? So that we think of some aesthetic properties being more perceptual, if you like, than others, and others being much more affective, containing kind of a larger degree of emotional content. So again, you might think of discordant as an aesthetic property that you can you know, perceive in, in an object of appreciation, Whereas serene is an aesthetic property which somehow involves my emotional response um, to the object of appreciation in a different kind of way. 
again, we see one way of understanding this variety in terms of a degree of appraisal involved okay, in our experience of the artwork. Okay. So what I have in mind here, of course, is again a spectrum which runs from something which is fairly descriptive to more kind of appraisal based. Okay, so we think of as exuberant, you might think, well, you know, exuberant is something that is something that this object of appreciation kind of is or is not, and I can describe that. And if you know what that term refers to broadly or what the concept means, I can see that this object of appreciation is indeed exuberant. Whereas in uh, attributing uh, the aesthetic property vulgar to the object of appreciation, I'm doing something more akin to appraising it, or kind of judging it, if you like. And again, <laughs> another way in which we think of this uh, 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 horizontal uh, variety is in terms of objective versus subjective content. I'm not entirely pleased with that way of describing it, and I'll come back to that in a second. But think of a spectrum as one which runs along, uh, runs along a kind of explicative to interpretative kind of range. So we, we, might go to, we might go from something like being lifeless, again, to something where our own kind of artistic, perhaps, interpretation is more actively involved in the ascription or attribution of the aesthetic property, as is the case with, uh, when we say that an object of appreciation is complex. I'm nearly, I'm nearly done, don't worry. <laughs> um, my penultimate way of passing this horizontal variety is in terms of a variation of of imagery and um, extrapolation. So you might think that some aesthetic properties are more literal than others, and others are more metaphorical, and that many of our aesthetic properties also then, of course, find themselves somewhere in the middle of, of the spectrum. So you might think of disorganized as something that we you know, ascribe to an artwork in a fairly literal sense, whereas saying that um, a piece of theater was sharp, for example, might be using uh, that property in a metaphorical way. And finally, um, you might think of this variety ranging uh, in scope or in application. You might think of it, and by that I mean within the object of appreciation. Right? So you might think that some aesthetic properties are fairly local in the object of appreciation. You might want to describe, you know, uh, just to oversimplify a bit, but you might want to uh, uh, describe uh, one part of a painting or one chapter of the novel, whereas others are more regional, if you like. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing an aesthetic property in the whole of the novel or in the, in the kind of entirety um, of the painting. Of course, on top of that, there is the distinction we've heard about between attributive and predicative, free and dependent beauty. In any case, I, I think you, you, you see where I am going with this. Okay. So I think these are some of the main ways uh, in which we can think of this horizontal form of variety running roughly you know, from one end to the next along this kind of spectrum. And of course, um, this tension um, between kind of objective versus subjective in some sense of being more object-oriented versus being more subject-oriented underscores um, many of these. Um, but we can talk about that more um, in discussion, perhaps. So I think that when we say um, that, that aesthetic properties are varied, we can mean any of these things. Or we can have several of these ranges in mind. Of course, they're not mutually exclusive, right? Uh, they're basically different ways of cashing out the same idea in some cases, and in others, they kind of take a step away from the previous one. They have complicated relations to one another, but I hope you find it kind of intuitively helpful, at least, to see how, how one can pass this variety. And in, in addition to that, of course, uh, we find um, subcategories that are... Um, listed very neatly <laughs> in this kind of literature. Um, and just to give you some of the main examples, we see, of course, that aesthetic properties tend to get grouped, as it were. Um, we can find the category of being of a kind of affective properties, um, behavior, emotion, expressive properties, but also formal properties, gestalt properties, stylistic properties, and taste properties. So it's fair to say that I think our taxonomy is already um, acquiring fairly considerable proportions. Okay? There's kind of generations of distinctions and differences within this, what you might have thought of originally as a fairly small um, category of aesthetic properties. So here's how we might think of the um, variety of aesthetic properties horizontally. 
But we can, however, also think of this variety, um, of this spectrum, if you like, in a way which I can only describe as kind of vertically, okay? as a variety of depth, if you like. And this is a diver diversity partly um, in the kinds of things to which we ascribe the same aesthetic properties. And the worry here, I think, is that the ontological variety in the objects of appreciation somehow also affects the nature of the aesthetic property, such that we get a diversity at that level too. Okay. So again, very roughly, plenty more to say about these kind of things, but very roughly, the different kinds of things to which we ascribe aesthetic properties include, and starting from, uh, from, from uh, kind of the lowest part of the slide, kind of everyday objects, okay, like handbags, or do you remember these Alessi citrus presses that were very fashionable uh, one, at one point? Uh, so we have just everyday objects, the kind of material objects we see around us, if you like. Then we have what I think of, oh, you know what? I think there's a, I, I made a mistake here. <laughs> special objects, you should, please reverse special objects and complex objects. Okay, so after everyday objects, I think of special status objects, which might be um, paintings or indeed churches. Then complex objects, which also have kind of some kind of perceptual manifestation. Okay, think here of a theatre performance or a large vista, a large landscape. But also, and this is, of course, along the kind of the top of the spectrum, if you like, more abstract objects of experience. Okay, so I'm thinking here of intellectual pursuits such as um, mathematical theorems, philosophical arguments, scientific demonstrations, but also moral uh, behavior, uh, moral character. So including actions and events, if you like. So what I have here, of course, is the notion of a kind of intelligible beauty or intelligible elegance, um, gracefulness or symmetry. And although these cases make for quite a difficult fit uh, with our contemporary aesthetic theories, certainly in analytic aesthetics, they were, of course, as I'm sure you know, uh, uncontroversial for the larger part of the history of aesthetics. Of course, for most ancient Greek, medieval, and rationalist philosophers, the conception of beauty advanced is one in which there is no um, contradiction implied by ascribing beauty to objects intelligible to the mind alone and those perceived uh, by the senses. Just to mention a few names here, uh, not without giving you a history lesson, of course, for Plato and Plotinus, the beauty which we ascribe to objects of sense perception is in fact understood to be inferior in quality and derivative of the beauty which we ascribe to exclusively intelligible objects. And uh, to refer back to our talk this morning, similarly, while Augustine's conception of beauty is primarily theological, the transcendent idea of God uh, being understood as beauty itself, um, Thomas Aquinas distinguishes physical beauty from spiritual beauty in order to privilege the beauty of souls over that of bodies. And again, uh, among the German rationalists, we find, for example, Christian Wolff, who holds that the experience of beauty consists first and foremost in the awareness of the harmony or concordance of a manifold or multiplicity of parts, and that such experience is no less available in connection with objects of the intellect than in the objects of the senses, with geometry, and philosophy ranking very highly as objects of aesthetic appreciation. And I could go on here, of course. Now, I think what's interesting here, and this is, of course, one way in which you know, philosophers have to think about the applicability of, of our research on the whole in our everyday lives. I think um, the broad span of our aesthetic attributions is largely unproblematic. Okay? They seem to clash neither with our natural inclination to discern aesthetic properties in many different kinds of contexts, nor with our ability to communicate efficiently uh, with each other about them. So why is this a uh, uh, metaphysical worry? Like, okay. In short, again, plenty of things to say here, but I'll, I'll just try to keep it um, brief. In short, horizontal diversity presents us to do, uh, sorry, with challenges to do 
with the, what you might think of as the metaphysical composition of aesthetic properties, right? As we saw, ranging from mainly descriptively charged, okay, to principal, principally evaluatively laden, from local to regional, from perceptual to effective, and so on. Okay. And here we see plenty of disagreement, for the composition of most aesthetic properties tend to be, you've guessed it, complicated. That's to say, neither exclusively emotional or exclusively perceptual or exclusively expressive. And as you know, um, we, well, for example, Jerry Levinson has written about the idea that, and, and Sibley, of course, that most aesthetic properties seem to have these like different char characters, uh, if you like. So um, if you follow Levinson, um, most aesthetic properties have both an evaluative and a descriptive com component, right? So hence the kind of the spectrum image. And uh, whereas um, some people will say that some aesthetic properties can be used as purely descriptive terms uh, because we can use them without committing ourselves to some kind of valence, if you like, others will hold that they simply can be no purely descriptive aesthetic properties and that the evaluative component cannot always be distinguished from the descriptive component. Okay? So there is disagreement about the specifics of the metaphysical composition internally to the aesthetic properties. So the challenge is not merely how to establish what such diverse properties as being garish or being complex or being impressionist could possibly have in common metaphysically with being ugly. It's also a question of trying to settle on the particular configuration of different components in a property of a specific kind. Now, vertical diversity presents us with different difficulties, <clears throat> since broadening our aesthetic repertoire to include not only material objects, and here I'm thinking both everyday, um, special and complex objects, but also non-perceptual or non-sensory ones, also introduces the idea that some objects of aesthetic appreciation are just not going to be capable of grounding or allowing for any kind of supervenience of aesthetic properties on their own physical and perceptual properties since they have none, or at least not in a straightforward sense. Or they do so, but in a far more complicated way than the paradigmatic material object cases um, suggest. So once we've met the task of establishing upon which non-aesthetic properties, say the elegance of a philosophical argument or the unity of a scientific demonstration supervenes, a difficult task in itself, how do we account for the metaphysical relation between these two sets of properties? Now, as you know, most metaphysical accounts of aesthetic properties rely on the very basic conception of the relation between aesthetic properties and non-aesthetic properties in objects of appreciation. Very roughly, the object has an aesthetic property in virtue of having certain non-aesthetic properties, right? You can think of this also in terms of grounding, if you prefer. But the basic idea here is, of course, that if there occurs a change in the non-aesthetic properties, there will also, that will translate into a change in the aesthetic properties, since there is some kind of metaphysical dependence here. So what aesthetic properties are is largely determined by how we conceive of this grounding or supervenience uh, relation. And again, to mention uh, Jerry Levinson, of course we see, and Derek here too, that here's this kind of standard way of thinking about this, namely that attributions of aesthetic properties to works of art are based on certain looks or feels or impressions or appearances that emerge out of lower order perceptual properties. And Derek, as you've written, the property depends in large part for its nature and existence on non-aesthetic perceptual properties. So of course a question that we've looked at a lot in aesthetics is what are the subvening properties in virtue of which a sorry in virtue of which uh, an object of appreciation o has an aesthetic uh, property perhaps especially in the context of um, 
our ontological attempts to define art and our um, theories of aesthetic value. And we know that relevant non-aesthetic properties tend to include physical properties, dispositional properties, and also lower level aesthetic properties in some cases, right? So beauty can depend on elegance, for example, or ugliness can depend on kitsch, okay? But also, and here's, here's the, here are the troublemakers, okay? Um, relational or contextual properties, such as the artist's identity or some kind of symbolic or contemporary references that the artwork's making in its semantic content, historical properties to do with authenticity and many other things, moral properties, um, and now, of course, uh, in, the, um, in the kind of age that we're um, living in, um, the issue of whether the moral character of the artist should influence you know, um, uh, their work. But also, I think, epistemic properties, okay? In the case of some of the intelligible objects I was telling you about, so just coherence and simplicity will be um, candidates for non-aesthetic properties upon which the aesthetic properties of, for example, a scientific demonstration will supervene. Or indeed, just to make it even simpler, any combination thereof, right? So even a brief examination of this kind uh, leaves us with some interesting observations, I think. First, that the metaphysical relation at the heart of aesthetic supervenience or grounding is likely to diverge or differ across cases in view of the great variety of aesthetic properties and property descriptions. That's number one. Number two, that complex and abstract objects, so remember this is the kind of um, um, the complex objects that I, that I mentioned, earlier, mentioned earlier in terms of the vertical variety, complex and abstract objects, present us with further complications, since in these cases, the relations between aesthetic and non-aesthetic properties don't seem to fit the standard model, okay? Or at least not neatly. I mean, we might try to squeeze it, but it doesn't fit it neatly. And finally, that even with everyday or special status objects, the ones you might think of as, you know, the more, um, the easier to deal with, aesthetic supervenience or grounding is not as, un, uh, as, sorry, as uncomplicated as many general accounts would have us believe. Both because not all subvening properties are physical or perceptual, but also because, and again, something that we've talked about a little bit here today, bec also because there is a kind of a balancing, a kind of weighing, perhaps even reasoning, okay, involved in processing how all these aesthetically salient properties interact in a particular object of appreciation. So I think the metaphysics is reliant on our participation here in more ways than one. Okay. Now, if this is correct, an aesthetic property diversity can run along both horizontal and vertical lines, a general metaphysical approach should be able to do the following, I think. First of all, it should be able to explain how perceptual non-aesthetic properties can ground aesthetic properties. Okay, which of course has hitherto been uh, the rather, I think, oversimplified metaphysical structure targeted by most explanations, and certainly the focus of most of our efforts to account for aesthetic properties. But it should also be able to explain how contextual, historical, moral, and epistemic non-aesthetic properties can ground aesthetic properties, both independently and in conjunction with other kinds of non-aesthetic properties. Think here of the kind of complex conglomerates of non-aesthetic subvening properties that I mentioned a moment ago. And of course, this is something that I think we started doing when we started thinking about defining a modern art, um, since in that kind of case, not all artworks um, uh, you know, wear their relevant aesthetic properties on their sleeves, if you like, right? So we might need to dig in terms of context, history, relational properties, and so on. Um, but our general metaphysical account should also be able to explain how non-aesthetic properties of all kinds can ground non-perceptual aesthetic properties. It's starting to get a bit more difficult. And I should also be able to explain how non-aesthetic properties of different kinds can ground the same aesthetic properties, but in different kinds of objects of appreciation. Okay. And I think they ought to be able to provide these explanations in a way which reflects our aesthetic phenomenology. Okay. That's to say the many different ways in which we experience aesthetic properties. 
and in a way which unifies all aesthetic property descriptions and experiences. So how ought we to move forward with this list of desiderata, which is not inconsiderable? <laughs> of course, one alternative open to us here with regards to horizontal diversity is, um, and this might be, you know, I think is in a way kind of a cheap trick, is simply to dismiss those properties at the extremities, right? Or those which co cause us extra difficulty and, and sacrifice the, the difficult properties, right? For the sake of strengthening the possibility of a unifying theory by, by disassociating the category of the aesthetic or by, by kind of removing, if you like, those difficult aesthetic properties from the category of the aesthetic and perhaps even kind of reclassify them elsewhere. Okay, so think here of, you might think of sad as being an emotional aesthetic property. It's difficult to explain that. Let's just remove it from the category of the aesthetic and place it just in the straightforward category of emotional properties. So in this line, as long as we can rely on a broadly similar metaphysical relation between subvening or grounding properties and most central aesthetic properties, our monistic aspirations can still be kept alive, right? albeit at a certain price. Because I think this strategy would most probably involve giving up on three, probably two, possibly four, and almost certainly abandon five for the sake of attaining a limited form of six. What of the vertical case? Here, we can't resolve to dismissing a property like beauty or elegance, okay, um, uh, in the way that I just described for the horizontal variety case, since they don't cause us those problems when they're instantiated in normal or everyday or uncomplicated objects, right? Instead, and the way this is the way this has often been dealt with, I think, if not resolved in mainstream aesthetics, where a standard conception has it that for an aesthetic experience, sorry, for an experience to be aesthetic, it has to be based in first-hand perceptual acquaintance and characterized by pleasure, is, again, simply to reject those problematic cases by saying that they aren't really aesthetic, after all. Okay? Either it's just a category mistake when we call a mathematical demonstration beautiful, or it's just a, a metaphor taken too seriously. That's the kind of standard way in which we, we tend to deal with those cases. I think, in fact, that so strong is the impulse to adhere to one unifying account of aesthetic experience that our standard conception of the aesthetic effectively disavows all the latter set of cases as genuine instances of aesthetic experience. Okay? This seems the wrong way to go. I think this strategy um, involves giving up on three, on aspects at least of two, very probably four, and again, almost certainly abandon five for the sake of attaining a limited form of six. So overall, you might think here that the most promising strategy would, would be to, to generalize. Okay, we have a lot of variety, let's bring it up. <laughs> so generalize to a very high degree, such that a sufficiently neutral terminology capable of describing what all aesthetic properties do and how they affect us um, become available. So think here again of Levinson's suggestion mentioned earlier, and Derek, you mentioned this also, whereby aesthetic properties are understood as higher order ways of appearing, higher order ways of appearing, dependent, and this is, sorry, this is a quote from Levinson, <clears throat> dependent in a systematic fashion on lower order ways of appearing, but not conceptually tied to them or inferable from them. And this is, of course, to avoid the kind of the reductivist threat, right? Or indeed, oh sorry, I, should, I think I should have switched here. I oh, know, yes, sorry. Or indeed, um, to think of Frank Sibley's theory, which holds that aesthetic properties, um, you know, roughly are those picked out by aesthetic terms, sorry, where such terms are those, the application of which require the exercise of taste. We, we rehearsed this um, a moment um, ago. Now, um, Yes, I think I'll leave that for the moment. So another um, more recent approach uh, developed by Vid Simoniti, and I think this will appeal to uh, Professor uh, Tessalin's talk from this morning, 
um, has it that aesthetic properties are powers to cause certain experiences in observers, where powers are potentialities or dispositions pointing towards some possible scenario. Okay. So aesthetic properties are a kind of dispositional properties, albeit they are different to color properties, right? Because color properties, you might think, um, seem more stable. And here, Vid Simoniti is making use of um, kind of various uh, texts, but including Mark Johnson's idea that it seems to be a basic phenomenological fact that we see colors as relatively steady features um, of external um, objects. So Vid writes this to explain his view about aesthetic properties. Instead, he writes, the phenomenology of aesthetic properties is remarkable in the following way. The paradigm case of aesthetic judgment, that is, the attribution of an aesthetic property to an object on the basis of direct perceptual acquaintance with the property, is certainly connected to some distinct, recognizable experience. Perceiving that something is playful, say, is in some way connected to a certain kind of qualitatively distinct, exhilarating experience. However, the non-realist's starting intuition, namely that this connection is one of being reducible to, this is my italics by the way, is contradicted by these cases. Instead, these cases lead us to describe the perception of an aesthetic property as a matter of looking out for the relevant experience in the object, or seeing the object as having the capacity to yield an experience, or as seeing the promise of something more that the object has yet to offer. So the subject perceives the object as having the power to afford her a qualitatively remarkable experience. So this, of course, is an account which I think has promised. It's certainly not without its difficulties, including the way in which one would explain what it is to just perceive a power and the kind of perceptual training it would take for one to be able um, to do that. But I think it has promise. And as I mentioned a moment ago, it does retain the possibility of realism in a way. I'll just say a few words um, about right at the end. So although I find that this proposal has perhaps more promise than some other accounts, I think we're still trading at a level of generality such that the uniquely aesthetic loses, if not all, then much of its distinct character. Okay. So as, as Simoniti himself points out, of course, aesthetic properties are not the only kinds of dispositional properties. I mean, he thinks in terms, of course, of, of being poisonous, being fragile, and so on. And although he emphasizes the need to move away from the non-realist assumption that aesthetic properties are reducible to a kind of an exhilarating experience, the most meat he adds uh, to the bones of his suggestion is that aesthetic properties are powers to cause experiences. And although these kinds of metaphysical, metaphysical proposals might tell us what kind of a thing an aesthetic property is on the global stage, if you like. Okay. It's not clear that it will provide us with a metaphysics which tells us which aesthetic properties are not. Or rather, what sets them apart from some other kinds of aesthetic properties. So, I'm going to draw my talk to a conclusion by coming to the fourth and final section. So let us begin to conclude by returning to the question with which we, we, we began. So can there be one metaphysical account of what aesthetic properties are, such that finding that account would represent truly significant progress in our field? Now, I think there is no doubt that ever since the emergence of aesthetics as an academic discipline, philosophers have sought to pinpoint okay, what is unique about the aesthetic explaining that which sets it apart from other kinds of qualities or other kinds of values. Of course, as we know, 
um, Kant opens up his third and final critique with precisely this philosophical move, right? Isolating the aesthetic first from the logical or the cognitive and the agreeable and then the mor moral in order to make room for this you know, new um, conceptual category. And methodologically, I think this seems entirely reasonable. For if the aesthetic is indeed to merit its own field of inquiry and deserve to be a bona fide philosophical subdiscipline, surely we ought to be able to identify the conceptual and practical boundaries underpinning our field. So this history of marking out um, the aesthetic territory, if you like, and trying to stave off any institutional danger looming if we remain vague about what the aesthetic really is, has of course also looked to metaphysics to find some answers. And our challenge is to establish how successful that appeal has been. Okay. So one risk um, with concluding that there cannot be one meaningful and informative metaphysics of aesthetic properties capable of meeting the desiderata I sketched earlier is of course simply that we have to abandon the category of aesthetic properties. For if there is no informative metaphysics capable of accounting for all properties we think of as aesthetic, then maybe there's a reason for that, namely that there is no such thing. Right? But since we tend to think of aesthetic properties as the kind of properties which have as their target um, aesthetic judgments, and aesthetic judgments are the kind of judgments which capture our aesthetic experience. And often, too, of course, aesthetic experience is the experience of aesthetic properties and so on. The, elimin sorry, the eliminativist threat might not be limited um, to the level of properties alone. Okay. What's really perhaps at risk here is the, the category of the aesthetic as such. And here I will um, just <laughs> uh, rather like... Uh, uh, a parent consoling a child, I'll just say, let's not worry too much. <laughs> okay. um, after all, there's plenty for us to do, even if this conclusion were, were the ones that we need to draw, and, and I haven't uh, concluded that. But after all, the phenomenology of our aesthetic experience still calls for um, explanation, as does the normativity of aesthetic judgment, okay, the abilities and all the sensibilities involved in aesthetic perception and more. So it may suffice to lower our theoretical aspirations. And with that, also at least, some of our metaphysical ambitions. So do we risk losing all realist prospects? Not necessarily. Okay. Our argument here today has just addressed the possibility of there being one unifying and informative metaphysical account of aesthetic properties capable of reflecting the phenomenology of many different kinds of aesthetic experiences. But in the face of these difficulties, we might well be willing to abandon six, namely the unifying desideratum. Or at the very least, the idea that it is the unifying theory which also has to be the sufficiently informative one. Okay? That's to say, we might well have one general account of a general kind, as I mentioned, which unifies, sorry, which unifies, but which fails to inform entirely adequately, perhaps like the one uh, we mo mentioned a moment ago by Vid Sim Simoniti. And correspondingly, we might have several subordinated, more fine-grained accounts, well adapted to the variety I've outlined, so which inform, but which fail to unify. This would then be a metaphysical monism at one level and a pluralism of richer explanations at another. Thank you very much. Thank you.